What's going on, guys? This is Sideboard Gaming Podcast. I am your host, Caleb Williamson. Uh, Today, unfortunately, it's just me for the podcast. Tim is really busy with work, so he's not able to attend right now. But um, we still have an episode for you guys, so stay tuned and listen in. Alrighty, guys, so the topic for today's episode is going to be out of game information and the first episode is going to be of the series is going to be on reading your opponent um so i just want to preface this real quick with a statement um i'm not saying these are absolute things that will work every single time but just take this in as a whole and think about ways you can do it um, once we go over the specifics and you know how you can apply this to your games, your locals, it's going to change person to person basis. So just keep that in mind as I go over today's topic and yeah, let's get going. So one of the things about this topic is that it's, it's really hard to, like I said, put it in absolute terms. Um, but it does apply to all games, if not, uh, specifically card games, because, you know, that's what we're all here to play. Um, and the fact is that there is a non-zero amount of information regarding out of game context or stuff you can take in from your opponent, reading your opponent specifically. Some of the things I want to talk about today are body language, stress level, things you can notice that your opponent's doing, whether they're, you know, how they shuffle, um, are they shaking their hands? Are they, um, like shuffling their hand in between turns when they're waiting for you to finish your actions and also the amount of verbal interaction they give you, um, you know, things like greeting you before the match or, uh, during the match, making little jokes and jests and things like that. So yeah, all of these things we'll go into more specifically, but there are some of the things I wanted to talk about that apply to card games and really taking in information from your opponent that's not just based on the deck they're playing and so so first off we have body language and i i have a story for each one of these that i just wanted to go over to kind of give you guys an insight onto what i was thinking when i uh, wrote it down so for my body language example i have one of my locals his name's brandon um we have a notorious joke going around whenever me and him play that I have a Pegasus eye whenever I play against him because I can almost always tell you what his next play is going to be before he does it. And it's not because I'm cheating. It's not because he's showing me his hand or he's telling me what he's going to do. It's simply because I can read him really well. I've been playing against him since the beginning of the game and he's been one of my locals, you know, for a very long time. I, we play quite a lot. And so, um, One of the things I can read is like, you know, if Brandon draws a card and it's not a very good card, he'll, you know, make a certain mannerism with his, his face or his eyes or, um, where he even puts the card based in his hand, like in the front, back, whatever. And you can just kind of read what, um, kind of their emotions are when they do certain things. And so with Brandon specifically, I've learned to read him very well and, um, I can't exactly tell you how, but it's just a a mix of things. Really. It's a mix of watching how he plays, um, what he does when he has a good hand, what he does when he has a bad hand, uh, you know, just things like that. And so body language is really important to pay attention to. Um, obviously this stems or it comes after like you've managed to learn to play your deck really well. And, um, um, when you, you know, master your deck, you can then start to master playing against certain people, certain types of people. And I think that's really like the next level of players is, um, learning to read players, read their, you know, all kinds of things you can read and it's really psychological. Um, and it, like I said before, it's quite difficult to put on paper, but I'm doing, I'm going to, you know, do my best here at giving you guys examples and encouraging you to practice, um, 
all of these things. So moving forward, we have um, stress level. So what I really wanted to talk about with stress level was that um, you can tell a new player by their stress level. Um, it might not always be a new player. There might be some underlying things going on, you know, whatever, but generally new players have higher stress level when concerned with big events. Um, and so some of the tells you can see is like, are their hands shaking? Um, when they shuffle, do they, you know, accidentally mess up and drop a card or, um, uh, you know, are they doing things like really fast, really slow, and just things like that. Uh, those are all things you can see and you can read into that player and see like, are they newer at this deck, you know, cause they don't know really what they're doing or are they newer at the game. And I'm not saying like you should abuse those things, but it is kind of a tell into um, what type of opponent they are. Right. And so when you can read that, it gives you a lot of advantage. Um, you shouldn't necessarily abuse that advantage, but maybe if it's a competitive event that gives you some insight as, as to what kind of plays they're going to make. And if it's not a competitive event, it gives you a good opportunity to help the player. You know, uh, if you're just at locals and you're playing and there's a really stressed out player, um, cause they don't, you know, play in small tournaments very often, then you can, you know, step in as the more experienced player and encourage them, show them some cool plays. Um, you know, I like to do that usually after I win, but you know, well, sometimes I lose, but, um, you know, it just be, presents a good opportunity. Um, and this whole episode, you know, out of game information, reading your opponent, it's not just about winning and losing. Um, it's really about like, performing well and having fun and it's for both players. So like if you find out that this player is brand new, I think there was a, there was a recent conversation in the dragon ball page about, um, Espira, the Twitch streamer. He had a new player on one of his matches on an online event. I think it was a pro play tour or something. And he, his opponent was very stressed out. You know, his hands were shaking. He was making some misplays, all that sort of stuff. And Espira took the time. He noticed that. He read the opponent. He took the time to kind of help the guy, give him some grace. And, um, you know, even though he got flamed in chat for, you know, the guy slow playing or whatever, that's not really what's important. The important thing is that a more experienced player took the time to read his opponent and find out that his opponent is new and stressed out. And he addressed that in the game and made the game more enjoyable for the both of them. And so I, I think stress level is not really something you want to abuse. Um, unless your goal is solely to win, it is something you can. I wouldn't say it's the most sportsmanlike, but just keep an eye, you know? Okay, so moving on to the third example. Um, I would say this one is one of the most important and difficult to learn. And, um, I've qu quite frankly learned it the hard way. Uh, so, uh, the third topic I have for you guys today is the amount of verbal interaction they give you. And so this goes all the way back to before your match even starts, you have, um, you know, you greet your opponent. You both sit down at the table, sometimes maybe not during COVID. You shake hands, you say good luck. If they don't do any of that, um, that can be a huge tell. One of the things that that tells me personally is that they're here to play and they're not here to have fun. Um, sorry, let me preface that again and redo that. They're here to play and they, they could be here to have fun, but maybe their definition of fun is solely winning. They're, like they're here for business, you know? And so, um, a good example of that, a player that I have played many times and 
actually I don't have a very good win record against him is uh, Dehan. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know who he is, but he's a competitive player. And uh, a lot of times when I first played against him, uh, I would feel like slightly intimidated because he didn't really give off, um, you know, like uh, verbal or physical cues as to like give me a reaction or body language that I can read. And that was like kind of frustrating because, you know, I'm a very psychological player. And so I like to kind of poke and prod at my opponent and get some information back. But when they're just, you know, not giving you anything that can be very difficult. And so, um, Dehan plays very, I would say, um, close to the cuff dragon ball. And he, uh, basically would not really talk a whole lot, do his plays two Oh, you know, I think I most recently I got two would by him. Uh, was that like the tournament of power event? And, um, you know, it was just like, man, what happened? You know, you look back and you're like, I did the, the game. Ju- he just clapped me and I don't know what happened because we didn't really have any social interactions. And so you can really learn from that though. And, um, some of the things that you can learn is that like, like I said, they're here for business. If they're not talking to you, they're not joking with you. They're not, you know, quote unquote, having a good time, then, um, they're probably there cause they're trying to win. So you can expect that they're going to have really tight play, probably minimal misplays and, um, just be prepared for that. So moving forward, um, I just want you guys to think about the more information you can take from your opponent, uh, the better understand you can really like understand the better you can really understand their play style. Sorry. Um, and potential play lines. So, uh, like I said earlier, this is difficult to put on paper or, you know, put into a podcast like verbally, but, um, all these concepts I'm talking about, if you just take them in and practice them, you can, start to read opponents and get like, it's kind of crazy. Like once you figure this out, you'll skyrocket in your actual, um, like tournament placings and performance and that sort of thing. And you'll start to realize more and more what your mistakes were rather than like, Oh, my opponent draw drew good, you know? And, uh, so an example I see many times of, you know, something I can read for, um, body language and like stress level is, uh, the good example is a dark Broly player, right? So when they can search the top of their deck with their front side leader ability, I, um, I pay attention to how they do that because when you search in dragon ball, you can do one card at a time. And the benefit of that is if you in specifically dark Broly and a few other corner cases, if you don't want to put something on the bottom of your deck or shuffle it back, you can just take what you want out of the top, you know, one card at a time. And so like in dark Broly, you get three 30 Ks out of five cards. So if you just flip three at three first, take the 30 Ks. And if you don't hit three, you flip the next two. Obviously all this is one at a time. Um, you can get better odds of drawing things like your super combos because they go on your other cards go on the bottom. And so if you just basically mill three 30 Ks, then your deck is that much smaller and your good cards are still in the deck closer to the top because you know, the rest goes on the bottom. Um, but what this really tells people is that it's a slight lack of understanding in the full extent of the rules because it is in the rules that you can go one at a time when you search the top of your deck. It's completely legal. It's not cheating, but a lot of people don't know that. And they just, you know, I'll search top seven, I'll grab the seven. And for the most part, it doesn't really make a difference because, you know, most of the searchers shuffle. And, um, so that makes it to where like the rest of the cards didn't really matter. Um, but 
in those certain cases where the rest of the cards either go to the bottom or they get you know placed in the discard um, it does make a difference a huge difference and um, so when my opponent doesn't do that the correct way it tells me or leads me to believe that maybe they're not you know familiar with the rules completely and that maybe they might not make optimal plays throughout the course of the game and so it's kind of tough because all of that is relevant to that certain match you're playing but there's a huge uh you know asterisk here it could just simply mean in this specific instance that they're trying to play faster and what they're searching doesn't matter and a lot of times that's the case but it still you know is good to make a mental note of that and check it off in your brain that hey maybe they don't know that this works that way and if there's more things that happen that are you know a little more flexible than they play it as then you can say hey they don't know how this works either and then this thing they don't know how that works and so maybe they really are a newer player or they you know they picked up this deck because it's supposed to be the best deck in the meta or whatever and they really just don't know what they're doing because like there's a lot of decks that you can pick up and play fairly simply but if you want to know like the top 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 tier plays you have to know the rules and how they apply to your deck and um you know then you get to do that play a little bit more efficiently and for the most part it doesn't make a difference but it does it is information and um information is how you win games and so you know pay attention to that um at least make a mental check and uh, maybe it'll pay off one day. Um, So another really good tell for seeing how good someone's hand is, is to watch them closely when they draw. One of the most like obvious ways that I know my opponent's combo power, which I wrote an article on on our Patreon not too long ago, Um, shameless plug there, sign up. It's uh, lots of free stuff and lots of uh, paid stuff too, which is pretty neat. So check out our Patreon at Sideboard Gaming. Uh, Anyways, so one of the things I wrote in Arglon was combo power, and it's really interesting to be able to guess how much combo power your opponent has in their hand. You know, most people, excuse me, most people will assume that you have zero fives in hand or like a super combo or two, but you can even go further in, you know, paying attention to how they are when they draw cards if they're you know kind of happy or where even where they put the card in their hand because like most people like me i like to put my groups of cards all together and so like my super combos are in a certain spot in my hand not necessarily like the same orientation as far as like in the back side or the middle or whatever but they're all next to each other typically and you know if you see someone draw a card and then like slide it into the middle in a very specific spot it might be the same card in their hand as another card in their hand. And so you can kind of guess based on that, plus what they've played, um, what the cards in their hand could add up to combo power wise. And um, all these things, you know, they really do add up and give you small incremental advantages. But I do want to emphasize also that you shouldn't start doing this type of stuff until you kind of have mastered how to play the game and like the basics and the rules and stuff because this is more of an advanced thing. And like, I would say like 75% of the time it's not going to make a difference in your games, but it does give you that additional 25% of the time win rate, you know, advantages and small things. And, you know, that's how you go X and O instead of X and one in a tournament where you played your bad matchup and you, you know, you read your opponent's, body language, hand, whatever, and you ended up winning, you know, they bricked or something like that. And so I just want you guys to think about this. Um, We're going to have a couple more episodes on uh, out of game information. 
Um, we're actually doing a like a little workshop in our team for some of our players. And so um, that'll be very interesting. But reading your opponent was the first one. Um, let me know what you guys think. If you have any other tells that are like, oh, your secret, you know, secret weapon. It's kind of, you know, people like to keep that hidden. Uh, but if you have anything interesting based on that, put it in the comments below. We're super excited and um, interested in talking about it. Um, you know, these little things are what really makes my mind tick. And I'm sure all of you guys have some sort of experience with it. And so um, I'm interested to hear your stories. And so at the end of the day, though, um, I can't teach you guys to read someone. It's something uh, you have to learn because everyone, every opponent, every single person has different mannerisms and um, they just act differently. And you never know, you know, what they could be, what they could be like, really. And so I can't straight up definitively teach you but I can give you some tips and that's what I tried to do today. And, um, a lot of this simply could not help you at all at the beginning of trying to learn how to read your opponent, but through some practicing and gathering, you know, information, every match, every opponent, um, it'll help you be a better player in the long run. And so keep, keep those tabs on people that you play, especially, uh, famous people like, you know, like the top players, if you play against them, pay attention to how they play and what they play. And, um, it might help you in the future. So, uh, all right, guys, just a little bit of bookkeeping. Like I said before, we have our Patreon. If you want to check that out, help us stay, uh, floating and support us monetarily. You can sign up for that. And you also get some rewards for that. Um, you know, obviously subscribe to our YouTube Give us a thumbs up. It helps quite a lot um, for getting our exposure out there and keeping up our content for our podcast. And then we have our merch store linked down below. If you want some cool shirts and stuff, check it out. And uh, oh yeah, our sponsor, Enders Games and Clovis. Check them out. They have a website and you can like pre-order product and all that sort of stuff. Um, they help us, you know, with various things that we need uh, from a store. And so anyways, guys, this is the sideboard podcast checking out. We have a shorter episode today, but uh, it's a good one. See ya.